I want to welcome Marianne Broadman and uh, Juan Granada. I'm Tony Dawson. This is a new session for us, and the, the goal here is to have an unscripted conversation mm -hmm. about really any topic, although we have a general topic of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe Mariana can start with you. Um, today you presented in the late breaking trials and um, showed us data from the Illuminate trial and two year data. That is a part of innovation where we are using information and the follow up at one year, two year mm -hmm. and further to start to help to mold what our decision making is. Mm -hmm in the field because you are um, able to get some of these devices before we do here in the US, mm -hmm. are there things like we're seeing now, drug eluding balloons and the data coming out that you have experienced over your career that um, when early data came out, it appeared to be very um, useful and influential that ultimately mm -hmm. we weren't using on a regular basis. And do you see any of that for drug eluding balloons or do you see an expansion of their use? So, so. Just to be honest, um, I mean, over this uh, development of chocolate balloon as a therapy option for SFA PA disease, uh, I would now summarize after six years, seven years of experience, that's a kind of workhorse balloon for SFA PA disease. Okay. Um, and, you know, we were very excited about the one year outcome because we had very bad one year outcome for Bober. And now we see that this data are sustainable at two, three, and also five years. Mm -hmm. So that's encouraging. And at the end of the day, that reduces costs because the patients are not coming back. And coming back for revesc procedures is a very important uh, percentage of uh, costs which are uh, uh, counting at the end you know, sure. for this kind of PAD patients. Sure. And, and they are safe. You know, we do not see at, at this long-term outcome any safety issues right now. Maybe you might uh, point out that, but you know, we, we always have this fear of immunosuppressive drugs that there sure. might be some side effects in the, in the long-term follow-up, but we do not see that. Yeah, I understand. So um, the other thing that I think kind of is a question that came from that presentation as well, is that we're doing better with the technical aspect of just regular balloon mm -hmm. angioplasty. And so the, the technique of drug uh, coated balloon yep. with long inflations and then yep. trying to compare yep. that to long inflations with regular balloons, do you think we're sort of what's old is now becoming new again and we should continue to at least heed the advice that these trials are showing us, the outcomes are so good? A regular balloon. Is that the reason you think it's that good? Uh, I think that's the reason it is that good because throughout these standardized procedures, because throughout this trial we have learned to do standardized procedures. Mm -hmm. We have not done that before. <coughs> and we had the, fir the first hint in the impact deep trial. You, you, yes. you, you remember that in the impact deep trial, the Boba arm really had a very, very good outcome. It did. So, so we had the first trial with low profile balloons doing, exact, doing the procedure exactly the same way as we did it with TCP. And I think we learned a lot how to treat our patients. Long inflations, uh, not to just blow it up in a very aggressive way, but in a very slowly way, to adequate pre-dilatation, not to underestimate the pre-dilatation balloon, not to underestimate the, the dilatation balloon. So, so I think that's something we really have learned, and I think that's a good education tool at the site, at the site of TCP. Very, very good point. Juan, um, you ran a session this morning on innovation and new technology. We were there together. Um, to, this field is moving very quickly, and, and you had one. Your first slides were very interesting, which showed, you know, the movement of this field with respect to loading, right? So, in an e on a computer bar, it's loaded about 25 percent compared to the coronary. Work. What, what do you think is going to fill in that other 75 percent, and how long do you think it's going to take to get there? Just for the audience's understanding, was that we're we're so far away from really having all the technologies 
at the same level as we do for some of the spaces like coronary. Mm. So peripheral is very far behind. So give me your insight in that. Yeah, no, which is, is great for, for the uh, peripheral field. And, uh, and I think the wrong way is very long for, for peripheral innovation. Um, if, if you look what happened uh, in the coronary field, there was a pathway that was started with balloons, then metallic stands and drug balloon stands, then durable polymers, bioresorbable polymers, bioresorbable polymers, and then continues to evolve over time. The problem is, the longer we go, the more difficult it becomes to improve clinical outcomes. Mm -hmm. The beauty uh, of the peripheral field right now is, is a wide open opportunity. Mm -hmm. I really think the biggest thing that happened in the last 10 years in peripheral innovation is that finally we were able to validate the concept mm -hmm. that drug elution makes a lot of sense for peripheral applications. And to be honest, I don't really think there is going to be a way back. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would even say, uh, it's a small crew, uh, we'd be careful to say this in the main arena, it's even irresponsible to do uh, peripheral angioplasty in the absence of local drug delivery. It's interesting, because Mary Ann just called I mean, it workhorse. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she, yeah, she said the I same mean, thing. It, is, yeah, it, is, yeah. it happened yeah. in the coronaries. I mean, yeah. right now, you've seen it. Who is using bare metal stents? Mm -hmm. Even in high-risk patients, these devices are so safe mm -hmm. that you cannot jeopardize efficacy because you think uh, a device is going to be less safe. So, so I really think we validated drug-coated balloons. This data was presented in this meeting. We have four-year data yeah. that shows the effect is sustainable, but it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need you know, to get 100%. Yeah, you see the, yeah. the patency or, or like DS, like that we are close yeah. to 93, yeah. 94 yeah. percent. Um, I personally believe that a balloon is perhaps not the ideal platform, mm -hmm. so yeah. great for now, but there are great opportunities right. to innovate for SFA and BTK. I don't really think they're going to be the same. They will be perhaps different technologies mm -hmm. for SFA yeah. and BTK. Lesion preparation is way more important peripheral than coronaries. Yeah. The coronary is pretty much lesion preparation is not really that important. <laughs> Unless it's a very heavily calcified exactly. or very diffuse, yeah. And one thing that we uh, presented uh, this morning is one thing that we really don't have in the uh, coronary field is we do have the no option patients, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they go to transplant. Mm -hmm. For peripheral vascular application, I mean biologics and the field of biologics and gene therapy mm -hmm. and, and, and local drug delivery is an amazing, an amazing field. Yeah. So it's, it's vibrant. It's, I mean, the multiple avenues of innovation is, is, is really uh, amazing in the peripheral vascular. I'm going to come back to you on that. I, 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 want to ask I, I would just to summarize that and, and, and I would say we have been a sleeping disorder for 40 years after Grinzing exactly. has done the first <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. in the peripheral field, and now we're waking up. This and, is I, it. And, and I think that, that's this it. Is it. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. So give us a little bit of a um, of glimpse from your vantage point in, in Austria and in, in yeah. Europe. What innovations are you seeing that we may not have any any glimpse into yet that you think are going to be part of our um, evaluation stream coming up? So, so I think one general thing is vessel prep, as you have pointed out. So we 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 need to do vessel prep because I want to make a quote and want to say, atherosclerotic disease is the cancer tissue of, of peripheral vessels. It is. Mm -hmm. So we have to treat that kind of cancer tissue. So we have to do vessel prep to deliver our drug at the end. And we have not found the final solution. We have good opportunities for SFA, and we are here in a, in a, in a very, very good way to, to find this final solution. We do not know anything for belodyne and for critical lymphocytic patients. So there are so many things going on in this field for critical lymphocytic patients where we do not have any glimpse what, what, we do not know what's the diagnostic issue, we do not know about hemodynamic parameters, we do not know about the outcome parameters, we do not know about objective uh, radiation of this kind of patients, and we do not know, we do not have any idea what's the appropriate treatment. Mm. We have a lot of, 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 of things which are promising, but we have to test them. So that's the most interesting field right now. That's for sure. Look, what do you think, if you, if, you, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, uh, CLI patients, mm -hmm. um, one thing that is interesting to me, everybody talks about cost and everybody talks yeah. about cost efficiency, but at the present time, I don't really think that operators even know if the intervention they're about to do and the amount of money mm -hmm. they're gonna spend 
is going to make a difference uh, yeah. in the patient. So, so one of the things is just imagine about risk stratification mm. technology. This is going to sound harsh, but imagine that yeah. you have this tool and then pretty much the tool tells you mm. you're not going to improve perfusion right. in this patient. Right. I have to tell you from the health economics point of view, yeah. perhaps an amputation is the best thing for the patient, yeah. quality of life, suffering, pain, and everything, mm. and for the healthcare system. So it's so interesting. There's a, a massive yeah. amount of innovation that is not just a medical device related, but also yeah. risk stratification, yeah. imaging, and so forth. So one of the attempts at doing this was uh, we had a meeting in April last year in Washington, which was the Vascular Leaders Forum. Viva sponsored it, and all the yeah. stakeholders that are in the field from vascular surgeons, radiologists, cardiologists, we had 10 people from FDA, CMS, PQRS, and, and, and some industry people all got into a room, and one of, the, one of the attempts was to discuss exactly what you're right. saying, which is can we build, like you build an STS score for patients that are gonna right. undergo TAVR, can you do the same thing, and using some of the criteria that are out there, like Wi-Fi, but incorporating other features yeah. that are not just patient and you know not just wound related but yeah. patient related and create scores that you ultimately then define to decide what to do to the yeah. patients. What, what do you think about that? I, I, I think that's the, the, that's the utmost need because at time now what happens? You see the patient said, okay, this is a frail patient. This patient has dementia, amputation. Mm -hmm. This patient does not have dementia maybe has a chance of wound healing. Mm -hmm. So it's a very subjective uh, addressing this kind of patients, but that's not an objective way. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we judge our patients in a very subjective way. So we have to go away from subje subjective to objective parameters, and we have to create some kind of scoring system. Look, the, for me, the, one of the most fascinating stories in innovation is the FFR story. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you remember, we trashed FFR mm -hmm. for years. Mm -hmm. And we said, this is a joke. Mm -hmm. I mean, this pressure measurement. Yeah. And I think as a business model and as a risk stratification model, it's brilliant. Yeah. That's true. It's brilliant. It's green light, red light. Yeah. Well, now do it, have, don't do it. Yeah. You have long-term outcome exactly. on that. I mean, I think that's when you have a trial that so tells have, you that. Yeah. Right? So when people talk about outcomes and when people talk about reimbursement, this is actually providing the best and conclusive way mm -hmm. yeah. to pay for a procedure. So the same thing is going to happen in peripheral vascular interventions in which you have the FFR of the leg, as I call it. Mm -hmm. And essentially you say, you know what? I'm sorry that we cannot spend $40,000 in this leg. It's, it's too far beyond this point. Mm -hmm. Or yes, you know, this is a patient that really need to invest the resources to get him back literally mm -hmm. on, on his feet. Interesting. So this morning we saw a couple of technologies that helped do that with tissue perfusion, et cetera. Um, one that we saw, which was Pedra, mm -hmm. um, at least attempts to give us some tissue perfusion exactly. numbers. Tell me, what do you think? Do you think that that's something that can overcome the limitations of things like TCPO2 and other, other endpoint analysis that we use right now we, that are yeah. functional? Will it be able to overcome that, or do you so think we had, still... We had, a, we had a, you know, tons of discussions in the past about this type of technologies because there are many things that you can measure. Mm -hmm. You can measure temperature, you can measure CO2, you can mm -hmm. measure O2, you can measure flow. There, there are so many things that you can measure. The question is, which is the one that makes most uh, mm -hmm. sense? Uh, an interesting thing about this technology is they detect flow. Mm -hmm. So if you have red blood cells flowing, mm -hmm. then essentially there is a detection method. So mm -hmm. that, that, that makes me uh, excited because oxygen may not be a good predictor, mm -hmm. all right? Temperature for sure is not a good predictor. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, tissue level perfusion yeah. um, is a, a very intriguing uh, concept and there are already three, four companies mm -hmm. having very, very nice uh, data. Uh, in terms of uh, tissue and perfusion. I mean, in a way, that's what we do with the SPECT, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and that also is very um, cost effective because it tells you where to stop with your reopening procedure. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes just sufficient to do the inflow treatment and you do not have to do the outflow treatment. So you, you spare a lot of money. Or if the patient restenosis early, yeah. you can bring the patient aggressively back that's, and reopen. And, and, and yeah. reopening, yeah. yeah. So, so I think that's, that, that's one of the biggest innovations in the future for critical ischemic patients, or maybe for any kind of patients. It is, it is sad, though, that, that our field is fully contaminated by uh, CMS and regulatory issues. Yeah. Because you cannot imagine how much these companies are struggling mm -hmm. to get these projects yeah. off the ground when, on my eyes, is perhaps 
This is what is going to unlock yeah. this field. Yeah. Well, Once do you, you th- have that, do, you, do you think, because so in the coronary field, you know, drug eluding stents, that was a device that had a drug. But one of the things I was listening to today in both the FDA sessions and others is that there's a lot of things, and you both mentioned them, which is the biologic treatment in combination with uh, device treatment. And so those are two separate parts of of the approval process. So it becomes so complicated. Should there be a path for a drug-device combination therapies that may be able to be treated together? I mean, this is a big, complicated question, right? I think yeah. I think it is, and that comes down to the uh, European model and the U.S. model to look at things, and and, and I think that. But the, the competent authorities are not so different in Europe. Yeah, no, what I, what, no. What I'm, talk, what I'm talking about <laughs> is that there is a component we have in the U.S. that really limits our capability to move yeah. more no, forward. No. At least the liability issue. Yeah. And and you know, to be honest, the scientific programs can be comprehensively evaluated by people that understand the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't really think it's that difficult and it should not really be that difficult to really go say green light or red light. Understood. And I really think we should, as physicians who have the responsibility, we should press on that and 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 and, and, and make pressure on our competent authorities that they change into that into that into that way. Exactly. So we should maybe make that a feature of the VLF portion of the advocacy that we're trying to accomplish. Well, we're uh, out of time, and if there's any last uh, comments, I want to thank Dr. Broadman and I want to thank Dr. Granada for some excellent conversation today. Great. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you.